Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to the first debate of the 2020 China Power Debate Series. I'm Bonnie Glazer, and I'm director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you all for joining us today virtually. This is our fifth year holding this event, which is usually a day-long series of, de of debates held at CSIS in Washington, DC. And this year, we've broken it up into five different events which we'll be holding over the coming month. And I hope that you will all join for as many as you can. And we're kicking off today's, um, the series with, uh, with a debate today on the proposition, US-China relations can best be described as a new Cold War. The concept of the Cold War originated shortly after the end of the Second World War. And it was coined to describe what became four decades of confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. The two nations were superpowers and competitors across several domains. Their relationship was characterized by profound strategic distrust. Both viewed the other as an implacable foe. Today, some analysts of international relations believe that the United States and China are entering a new Cold War. Others argue that the historical analogy is erroneous, misleading, and even dangerous, and that the nature of US-China rivalry should be understood on its own terms. Now, before we begin the debate today, it's our tradition at our debate uh, series um, that we vote on the proposition. And uh, so I wanna start out by asking everybody um, who is uh, online and listening to us today and watching uh, to cast their vote, uh, either agreeing or disagreeing with the proposition. And you can see online, there's directions about how to do that. There's two ways you can cast your vote. You can go on the, on the internet, you can go to pollev.com slash CSIS, or you can do it on, uh, on, your, on your phone. And uh, so if you do it on your phone, you text to 22333, and uh, you, then you text CSIS, you'll get a message that you've joined a particular session, and then you'll type in either agree or disagree. So you can either vote on your phone or on the internet. And I'm gonna give you a minute or so to actually vote on the proposition. And then after we listen to our debaters, we're gonna vote again and we'll see what, uh, what has changed or if anything has changed in how people vote. And uh, after we tally these votes, I'm actually going to show you the results of a poll we've done on Twitter. So we've had this proposition up in a Twitter poll over the last three days, but I want to show the results first of the polling that we're all doing right now and hope that you are all casting your votes so that we can do that in a couple of minutes. And while the votes are being cast, I'm going to introduce our speakers. So arguing for the proposition, we have Dr. Hal Brands, who is the Henry A. Kissinger Professor of Global Affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and also a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. His newest book is The Lessons of Tragedy, Statecraft and World Order, which is co-authored with Charles Edel. Arguing against the proposition is Dr. Melvin Leffler, who is one of the world's leading experts on the Cold War and a professor of history emeritus at the University of Virginia. And his most recent book is Safeguarding Democratic Capitalism U.S. Foreign Policy and National Security, 1920 to 2015. So this is how our event is going to run over the next hour and 15 minutes. Both speakers will have a maximum of 15 minutes to present their initial remarks. And after they both make their arguments, each will have an additional five minutes to respond to the remarks that the other speaker has made. 
And then we're going to take questions uh, from our viewers. All the questions should be directly pertinent to the proposition so that the answers enrich the debate and help our understanding of the speaker's arguments. So um, I'm gonna ask you if you do have questions to please submit them. Um, you can do it in advance or after the speakers have made um, their presentations. And to submit a question, you go to the CSIS page, csis.org and our, our event is there and you click on the button that says, ask live questions. And if you're having any difficulty finding that button, then you can email your questions to hprice at csis.org. So that's hprice, P-R-I-C-E, at csis.org. And then I will uh, accumulate the questions and I'll be answering, um, I'll, be, uh, I'll be putting them up for uh, our speakers to answer them. Uh, during our, our Q&A period. So I hope I've given you all enough time uh, to vote on our proposition, either by texting or going uh, to the web. Um, and so uh, let's see if we can put up the, res the initial results of our poll. Okay, so we have, um, as people are still voting. If you want to go ahead, vote some more. We have more than 500 people registered for this event. So I'm sure there are more people out there. Uh, but so far we have 16 that agree, 17 that agree and 21 um, who disagree. I hope people aren't having, aren't having technical difficulties um, uh, and voting on this. Uh, but once again, you can text it or uh, you can put it on, uh, on the web. Um, pretty close, not too much of a disparity. We've got 18 who agree and 24 um, who disagree. Um, well, well, what we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna let you keep uh, uh, voting just for a couple of minutes, but I wanna put up the results of our uh, Twitter poll. We had a very large number of respondents to the Twitter poll. We had 22,000 uh, 2, 425 respondents. And you can see this is again over the last three days, um, we had 55.2% uh, who agreed with the proposition and 44.8% uh, who disagreed with uh, the proposition. So a little bit different. Um, maybe we'll just go back and look at our poll that we're doing right now, just one last time. So we have 19 agreeing and 25 disagreeing. Um, I'm going to have to close the poll in about 10 seconds. So if you, if you want to vote, please cast your votes. And then again, we're going to do this vote after, uh, after the debate and we'll see how that has changed. Um, so, okay. So we've got a few more votes in here. Um, not as many as I'd hoped for, but uh, we'll see what happens after our debate. So I think we're going to close the, uh, the voting now and we are going to start our debate. And I'm going to start... Um, I think with uh, we scheduled uh, to have Hal Brand start first, arguing in uh, in support of uh, the proposition today that U.S.-China relations can best be described as a new Cold War. Over to you, Hal. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, it's a real pleasure to to be here, and I'm glad to be able to spend the after part of the afternoon with with everyone uh, debating this important topic with. Uh, uh, Mel Leffler, who I've have long uh, looked up to in the field and consider a good friend, so I'm sure that this will be uh, a fun conversation. Uh, I hope we got as many agree votes as possible before I started talking, because it's all over at, at this point. Th those votes are going to dry up, and I'm only partially kidding, because uh, while my, my task is to make the argument that the U.S.-China competition is a new Cold War, I'm, I'm actually going to make a little bit more of a nuanced argument uh, than that. Uh, because I think it, it's actually quite obvious when you look at the U.S.-China competition, there are myriad ways in which that competition differs sometimes dramatically from the Cold War. And in fact, uh, I think you'd be hard, to, hard pressed to find um, uh, any reasonable commentator who would argue that the Cold War is an exact analog for the U.S.-China competition uh, or that there are not major differences between past and present. I want to stipulate to that. My argument is a bit more complicated. In fact, it's, it's almost more of a methods argument than a substance argument. And so, so here's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to kind of stipulate to the, all the ways in which this competition is much different than the Cold War, uh, just to show you that I do, in fact, live uh, in reality. Uh, 
Second, I'm going to list a variety of ways in which understanding, studying the Cold War can still usefully understand, uh, under, inform our understanding, that is, of, of what is happening and what we should do today. And so in brief, my argument isn't so much that we're seeing a replay of the Cold War, it's that the Cold War is still invaluable history and in equipping ourselves intellectually for the competition we're facing today. So let me take the first part of that. So, so even though um, I, I've already stated the Cold War is not an exact analog for US-China competition, let, let me prove to you that I actually believe that by listing some of the many differences between then and now. Uh, China is not the Soviet Union. It doesn't have the same messianic ideological compulsion, although there is a strong ideological element to its statecraft, and it does have more of a zero-sum approach to politics than we re sometimes realize. Xi Jinping is not Stalin, although he clearly admires him and may in fact be getting there over time. The geography of the competition is not the same. Maritime Asia is not Central Europe, and that has implications for escalation dynamics, the role of nuclear weapons, and military competition more broadly. There are aspects of this competition that don't have obvious Cold War parallels. The struggle to control data, for instance, the struggle to influence information networks and dominate high-end commercial technologies, I think are all good examples. The level of economic integration between the United States and China is orders of magnitude higher than it ever was between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union. The global setting uh, is also different. Right now, one of the challenges that the United States faces is that the world order uh, is under strain. In the late 1940s, the major challenge that the United States faced was that there was no world order. There was chaos everywhere. And so in short, the issues are not entirely the same. The players are not entirely the same. The setting is not entirely the same. And so how can I still sit here and say that the history is worth studying? Well, for one thing, this is actually how learning from history works. One case is never exactly like the one that came before it. In fact, historians will go on endlessly about how events are like snowflakes and no two are exactly alike. And yet that doesn't stop historians, and I include myself here, from trying to extract useful insights and even lessons from the past. And the reason that we do that is that there is no alternative to doing so. If you really think we can't learn anything from a past that doesn't precisely resemble our present, I would submit that there's no reason to study history in the first place. And so what we have to do and what historians tend to do uh, is to engage in, in what uh, my mentor, John Gaddis, called selective generalization, to try to figure out what aspects of the past can inform judgments about what we ought to do uh, in our own time. And so the, the Peloponnesian War wasn't exactly like the Cold War by any means, but U.S. policymakers like George Marshall still drew useful lessons from it in the late 1940s. That's, that's the same task of policymakers seeking to use history in any era, by the way, and it's the same task that we face today. A second point is that learning from history is viable when you're studying two, theme, two things of a roughly similar type, and that's the case here, because both the Cold War and the US-China competitions are instances of long-term great power competition. That is to say, they're instances of protracted rivalry in the space between peace and war, between major powers that are trying to shape the international system. Uh, in, in a book that I wrote a number of years ago, I, I argued that there is an underlying logic of grand strategy that can be applied, not precisely, but broadly across time and space. I would say the same thing about long-term competition. There are patterns that pop up in competitions across the eras. There, there are general, if not universal, principles about things one should do and one should avoid, even as we recognize that no one scenario is just like the next. And so studying this earlier example of long-term competition can tell us something useful about where we are and where we're headed today. And again, I don't, I don't think this should actually be a controversial statement. Uh, no one really questions that the Peloponnesian War can illuminate larger dynamics about war and conflict and human nature. People basically accept that Clausewitz, who had studied the Napoleonic Wars and, and derived most of his insights from those wars, could extract larger lessons about military affairs. And so studying a clash as epic as the Cold War ought to tell us something useful about great power competition more broadly. And in fact, this is precisely the argument I make uh, in a book I have coming out on this subject. Uh, third, uh, the Cold War uh, certainly isn't the only historical example of long-term great power competition, but it is one of the only examples that we Americans have in our experience. The Cold War is the only time in our history we have done concerted long-term competition over a period 
of decades. And so if we're looking for some uh, admittedly imperfect analog to what we assume will be a multi-decade competition today, and I do assume that, if we're seeking to learn something about how America does long-term competition, where it does well and where it does poorly, we really don't have a lot of other examples in our own history to examine. In fact, we're going to be naturally drawn to this example because it is the one we remember. It's, it's within the living memory of many American policymakers. And so we might as well know that history as well. But this brings me to, I think, the most important reason, which is that while there are many differences between the Cold War and the present era, there are more similarities than we might like to acknowledge. The Cold War was a global duel over power, position, and world order. So is the US-China competition. The Cold War was about ideology as well as geopolitics. That's the case today. The, Cold, the, the CCP isn't simply mounting a geopolitical challenge to US interests. It's also mounting an ideological challenge to the supremacy of democratic values by seeking to create a world in which authoritarian systems are protected and perhaps even privileged. The Cold War required the United States to mobilize and manage over many years a set of unwieldy coalitions to contain Soviet power. The same is true in the US-China competition. The Cold War required mobilizing American government for rivalry, developing deep knowledge about the adversary. It entailed figuring out uh, how and whether to try to split one's rivals and exploit the weaknesses of their political systems. It, it required finding areas of cooperation amid great hostility and so on and so forth. If any of these things sound familiar, it's because all of these tasks will also be essential in the US-China competition. And so yes, it would be foolish to mindlessly apply Cold War solutions to post-Cold War problems, but I think it would be equally dangerous to ignore the insights that the Cold War has to offer about all of these challenges. And in fact, I would argue that studying the Cold War uh, reveals insights. So not things that you can do tomorrow, but broad intellectual guidelines that are useful in thinking about the US-China rivalry uh, uh, today. And I, I would at least hope that this is the case. And so let me just list three of these as, as proof of concept. Uh, and we can talk about them more during the, the back and forth. The, the first uh, is that one, one lesson from the Cold War that is true today is that the United States is going to need a theory of victory that can be sustained over a generation or more. The, the value of containment was that it identified what the U.S. sought to achieve containing Soviet influence until the Kremlin regime mellowed or crumbled. It specified how the U.S. would do so in a broad sense by denying Moscow the fruits of expansion and increasing the pressure under which it operated. It specified why that strategy would work because the Soviet system was itself beset by inner pathologies that would work their way to the surface over time so long as the Kremlin wasn't able to increase its power through expansion. That strategy was simple enough that it could be replicated across presidential administrations, it could be understood by the bureaucracy, but it was flexible enough that it could be adapted as geopolitical circumstances changed. And most importantly, it steered the country between two unacceptable extremes. On the one extreme, you had the diplomatic appeasement that the West had tried against Hitler prior to World War II, uh, and that some commentators favored vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union in the late 1940s. On the other extreme, you had the, the sense that we were destined for conflict, and so perhaps we should just get on with the Third World War against the Soviets while we had an atomic monopoly. That too was a surprisingly widespread proposition in the late 1940s. Containment, of course, was based on the idea that you didn't have to go to either extreme. If you were firm but patient, you could avoid catastrophic retreats and catastrophic escalations. These provide good guidelines for today, although we're, we're not there yet in terms of developing our own strategy. There's a broad consensus that engagement has failed to tame China, that a more competitive approach is required. But U.S. officials haven't really clarified America's long-term strategic goal. Is it regime change? Is it just holding the line against Chinese expansion? Is it building leverage so we can cut some comprehensive deal? We need to answer this question before we can talk about being competitive uh, over the long term. And we need to determine what level of risk we're willing to run, what level of investment we're willing to make to bring about that end state that, that we identify. And if the Cold War teaches us any, anything, it's that this is an area where we need greater intellectual investment. A second lesson of the Cold War is that the outcome of long-term competition will be determined as much by what we do with our friends as what we do to our rivals. The single most important thing the United States did during the Cold War will also be the single most important thing it needs to do in competition with China, which is to keep its coalition of allies and partners together. During the Cold War, the United States fundamentally changed the trajectory of the free world. It turned Western Europe from a region that had torn itself apart twice in a generation 
to a zone of prosperity and peace. It linked itself to the key countries of Western Europe and East Asia through alliances that fostered deep institutionalized cooperation. Those relationships were critical uh, to what Dean Acheson called situations of strength in the competition uh, with Moscow. And this is something, of course, that Mel has written about uh, quite wonderfully in his book, A Preponderance uh, of Power. These relationships bound the United States to its allies. They ensured that the communist world could never outstrip the collective strength uh, of the free world. And those alliances and partnerships are going to play a critical role in the coming years. Yes, the United States will need different sorts of coalitions in the China competition than it did vis-a-vis the Soviet Union. But frankly, if the United States remains tightly linked to countries ringing China's periphery, it's going to be really hard for Beijing to dominate its geopolitical neighborhood. If the United States maintains solidarity with the world's democracies, it's going to be far easier to cope with the threat China poses. If the United States rends those relationships, if it fails to prevent China from weakening them, its competitiveness is going to erode as its isolation uh, increases. And and so this is a clear lesson of the Cold War that I think uh, uh, pertains equally today. And then let me just mention one one more, which cuts in a little bit of a different direction, which is that negotiation can actually be a tool of competition. This often comes up in the context of the detente of the 1970s and its lessons for Sino-American competition. The detente had complicated effects on America's competitive position during the Cold War. It probably did make it a little bit harder to maintain adequate defense budgets. Uh, It created the impression, uh, particularly among some on the left, that negotiation was an alternative to competition rather than a complement to it. Uh, It provided the Soviet bloc with some economic benefits, although they mostly wasted those. Um, But but detente also had some significant positive competitive effects. The strategic arms accords of the 1970s capped the numeric arms race. They imposed ceilings on the number of weapons that we could build or the Soviets could build. That was hugely to America's favor over the long term because it shifted the arms race from a contest of who could build the most missiles, the Soviets were good at that, into who could build the best missiles. We were good at that. Detente slowed the pace of the superpower competition at a time when we were winded after Vietnam. And the fact that detente ultimately failed, that it didn't fundamentally change Soviet behavior, helped convince us that we needed to come back to a more aggressive strategy uh, in the 1980s. And and not least of all, one of the virtues of detente was that it made the Cold War a bit safer for the United States and thus made it easier to persevere in that competition over time. There is a larger lesson here. You you don't want to pursue negotiations with a totalitarian enemy as an end in themselves. You, You should expect that they will cut corners and cheat. The Soviets did, but negotiation can be a valuable way of introducing pauses when you need to take a breather, can be a way of probing the other side's intentions, of of demonstrating to your own public or allied publics that you do desire peace. And and above all, it can be a way of making the costs and dangers of the competition somewhat more tolerable, which makes it likelier that you'll stick with the competition long enough to win it. And indeed, if you think that your system is stronger than the other guy's system, and I think that is the case today, then keeping the competition within limits through diplomacy, through the periodic search for de-escalation, can be a matter of keeping things from blowing up long enough for the the weaknesses of the other system to take their toll. There are plenty of lessons uh, as well, but I think my my basic point here would be this. I I understand why people don't like invoking the Cold War to describe the Sino-American rivalry, because the Cold War was kind of awful and dangerous, and who would want to repeat it if they could avoid it? But I think the danger is that if we just reject the relevance of the Cold War, we're also losing a ton of intellectual capital about what it takes to succeed in long-term competition. If we study the Cold War carefully with an eye to the similarities as well as some specific differences between past and present, we can profit quite a bit. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing Mel's presentation. Terrific, Hal. Thank you so much. We'll now turn to Mel Leffler to argue against the proposition that U.S.-China relations can best be described as a new Cold War. Bonnie, many thanks uh, for inviting me to participate in this debate. Uh, I'm delighted to be discussing this with Hal, uh, with whom I've discussed this uh, numerous times uh, before. And I've learned um, an enormous amount from Hal's prolific writings on grand strategy and the end of the Cold War and contemporary foreign policy. Uh, So I respect um, his insights greatly, but uh, on this issue, um, I disagree with him. Uh, Invoking the metaphor 
or the analogy of the Cold War uh, is not a helpful way to describe uh, Chinese-American relations today. And um, I think um, Hal likes to go back and, and, and reference uh, methodology. So I'll talk about a book um, that was written many years ago by two famous scholars, uh, Ernest May, a historian, and Richard Neustadt, um, a political scientist, international relations expert. They, made the they wrote a book uh, called Thinking in Time. And they made the point that uh, policymakers are always using historical analog analogies, um, but they often use those analogies uh, unwisely. May and Neustadt uh, in that book did not argue against using historical analogies. In fact, they said historical analogies um, can be very useful if they are used to clarify context, if they are used to clarify options, if they are used to clarify dilemmas. And most of all, they emphasized, May and Neustadt emphasized, that the ultimate goal of thinking in time, the ultimate goal of employing historical analogies is to nurture prudence, to nurture prudence. So we need to ponder, when we discuss this very issue, we need to ponder whether thinking we are in a cold war with China helps to clarify options or helps to nurture prudence. So my argument today is that the cold war analogy is misleading and it's actually counterproductive. The cold war analogy exaggerates greatly the threat emanating from China and the cold war analogy overlooks the saliencies or elides the saliencies, the saliency of many of China's strengths. We do have a rivalry with China, totally in agreement with Hal on that point. We do have a competition, but we do not have a cold war. And I would suggest that prudence dictates that we try to avoid turning a rivalry, a, even a great power rivalry, into a Cold War. So what was the Cold War? I think a good de definition of the Cold War is that it was a zero sum geopolitical, economic and ideological struggle between countries whose leaders denied the very legitimacy of the other, whose leaders defined victory in terms of the destruction of the other's core values. Although China does things today that we abhor, we're not in such a struggle with China today. The geopolitical, ideological, and economic context today is totally different than in the 1940s when the Cold War began. And these differences matter greatly for the way we should define both threats and opportunities. So let me um, take five minutes or so to explain why the context is so different today. First, let's look at the geostrategic dimension and the distribution of power. In the late 1940s, a bipolar system of international relations emerged, but it was a very peculiar bipolarity. The United States was vastly stronger than the Soviet Union, but at the same time, the Soviet Union had tremendous potential to make geopolitical gains. Soviet armies at the end of World War II occupied most of Eastern Europe and parts of Northeast Asia. Beyond those armies, there were vast vacuums of power. Germany and Japan were, uh, were, were defeated, occupied, demoralized. China was engulfed in a brutal civil war. Western European countries were beleaguered with political ferment and economic chaos. Their colonies were in revolt. Britain faced bankruptcy 
and had to withdraw from the Eastern Mediterranean and from South Asia. The United States participated in the occupation of Germany, of course, and monopolized the occupation of Japan. But everyone expected the United States to withdraw shortly. When I say everyone, I mean everyone. Friends, foes, and most Americans themselves assumed the United States with, would withdraw. The United States had no post-war alliances, had no peacetime strategic commitments. As a result, in the immediate post-war years, the Soviet Union appeared, appeared to have vast opportunities to capitalize on the vacuums of power. The Soviet Union appeared to have a real opportunity, even in peacetime, to gain direct or indirect control over the preponderant resources of Europe and Asia, much as the Axis powers had done in the late 30s and the early 40s. The Soviet Union might then be able to wage a protracted struggle against the United States in wartime should war erupt, or to undermine the economic viability of the American economy in peacetime. Now let's forward to today and let's consider the geopolitical context and the distribution of power in the international arena. China today is surrounded by a proud and wealthy Japan. China is surrounded by a robust and nationalist India. China today is surrounded by a revanchist Russia and a competitive South Korea. China today is surrounded by countries with whom the United States has alliances, bases, and longstanding military ar arrangements. China today, in short, China today, in short, has no ability to make geopolitical gains comparable to the ones we saw th we thought the Soviet Union could make at the end of war at the end of World War II and the early Cold War years. Now let's go to the ideological dimension. After capital, after World War II, capitalism was in disrepute. It was widely blamed for two world wars and a Great Depression. Everywhere in Europe and Asia, the left was on the rise. Socialism, planning, land redistribution, command economies had vast support. Communist parties had great appeal. In France and Italy, where they contested for power. The Labour Party in England came to power in June and July of 1945. The Labour Party was a socialist party seeking the national industry of key nationalization of key industries and key banks and implementing a vast social welfare program. Beyond Europe, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, Marx's Leninist ideas had vast appeal amongst a new generation of emerging revolutionary nationalist leaders. These revolutionary nationalist leaders in most places were not communists. They were not communists at all, but most of them embraced the idea. Most of them embraced the idea that their countries were backward because of imperial greed and capitalist exploitation. These revolutionary nationalist leaders believed that planning, nationalization, and status policies could produce modernization, could enhance their power, could bring about higher standards of living for their people. In short, the onset of the Cold War, there was a real ideological rivalry with a I, with an ideology that had vast appeal. And that ideology challenged fundamental core values like, values like private property, marketplace economy. And that rival ideology had universal appeal because it called, however specious, it called for justice, equality, opportunity, and modernity. Let's, let's, let's fast forward to China today. China has no ideology comparable to the appeal of Marxism, Leninism, and socialism, and communism in the aftermath of World War II. 
China offers no such universal inspirational message. President Xi trumpets, quote, socialism with Chinese characteristic. His message is nationalistic. It's not universalist. He does not assail capitalism. President Xi does not call for revolution. And everywhere around the world, people appreciate China's great economic success, and they look to China for markets and capital. But everywhere, peoples and leaders grasp China's nationalist ethos and nationalist ambitions. Everywhere, views of China have grown starkly more negative. In short, the ideological competition from China does not at all resemble the competition with the Soviet Union in the early decades of the Cold War. And now let's look at the economic context. At the end of World War II, at the end of World War II, the United States had two thirds of the world's gold reserves, three fourths of its invested capital. More than half of the world's manufacturing cap capabilities were inside the United States. The US gross domestic product was at least three times, probably four times that of the Soviet Union and more than five times that of Great Britain. The United States was the world's economic and financial hegemon when the Cold War started. But after the end of Lend-Lease, at the end of World War II, what was significant was that the United States virtually had no economic and financial relations with the Soviet Union. There were no post-war loans, no post-war investments. Indeed, while the United States yearned for an open, integrated international economy, a world, open world marketplace, the Soviet Union sought to isolate itself from the rest of the world economy. Now again, let's fast forward and grasp how different the world is today. China's gross domestic product pretty much equals that of the United States, perhaps surpasses it. China is central to the health of the international economy. It's the world's leading trader. It's America's third leading trading partner. China holds more than a trillion dollars of US bonds and treasury bills. The United States is now a debtor nation, running huge trade deficits and budgetary deficits. So what does this mean? in terms of the way the United States should think about its national security. Simply stated, very importantly, the contrasting geopolitical, ideological, and economic circumstances means that threats and opportunities today are totally dissimilar to the Cold War. Cold War analogies, therefore, make very little sense. The threat today from China is nothing resembling the threat emanating from the Soviet Union after World War II. When China takes aggressive actions today, when it builds makeshift actions, the United States should take note and should react and take steps to react. But at the same time, Americans and others need to have a grip and to realize just how vastly different Chinese actions are today even in the South China Sea, than Soviet actions in Eastern Europe, in places like Poland and Romania and Bulgaria after World War II. Also, the different geopolitical, ideological, and economic landscape means that opportunities are totally different. The United States does not have the financial leverage today to reshape the world as it did in the immediate aftermath of World War II, as it did at Bretton Woods and when it launched the Marshall Plan. Nor does the United States today have this strategic heft that it had at the end of the Cold War. Truman's Cold Warriors believed that the Soviet Union wanted to destroy our way of life, but they also believed that the Soviet Union would, re would retreat when confronted with superior American power. That in fact was the fundamental axiom of Kennan's containment policy. 
the Soviet Union would retreat before the exercise of American power. Such axioms, I suggest, don't prevail today. Altered circumstances, therefore, impel a cost-benefit analysis of the Cold War strategy. In the, me in the middle and late 1940s, the cost of a pros prospective Cold War seemed low compared to the prospective benefits. The existing status quo was portentous. If the United States took action, the, the Kremlin might clamp down in places like Eastern Europe, but the United States would gain a preponderant position, a preponderant position in Western Europe, Western Germany, and Northeast Asia. Gains exceeded prospective losses. The Soviet Union had scant ability to inflict economic or financial hardship and would hesitate to challenge America's strategic superiority. Today, prospective costs are much greater and prospective benefits much smaller. The benefits are smaller because the Eurasian balance of power is not in question and because our existing allies along China's periphery actually do not want a Cold War. Turning a rival into an enemy makes little sense when that rival, unlike the Soviet Union, constitutes the hub of the international economy in which the United States and its allies have a vast stake. Moreover, turning a rival into an enemy makes even less sense when you need that rival's cooperation to deal with fundamental threats endangering our national interest. And this is the last key point that I want to make. When the Cold War began, no one doubted that the most critical factor affecting the national security interests of the United States related to the configuration of power in Europe and Asia. But today, today, pandemics and climate change loom as larger threats to our national security. And to deal with these threats, we need transnational cooperation. So why invoke a Cold War analogy when doing so is likely to produce more harm than good? Why make China into an existential enemy when it constitutes a normal great power rival with whom competition is inevitable, but with whom cooperation is indispensable? Context, in other words, context makes the Cold War analogy inappropriate and prudence demands that we reject it lest we produce an outcome that will cost us more than it will benefit us. That's why I think this proposition is not a good idea. Thank you. Great, that was terrific. So I wanna give each of you just uh, a few minutes, maximum of five, so we can get to some questions, please. Hal, do you wanna to respond to some of the points that Mel made? Uh, sure, I'll just, I'll say a couple of things. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of the points that Mel makes about the differences between the 1940s and today are, are accurate and they're well taken, but let me, let me quarrel with uh, one of the, the differences that, that he draws. And so I think Mel's argument is that the Cold War was a zero sum struggle, whereas there are significant positive sum dimensions to the US-China rivalry. And, and neither of those assertions is entirely wrong, but they're both, um, I think, distortions of, of the truth. And so that the Cold War was not an entirely zero sum rivalry. It was close to that at times, but even at, at times of intense competition, there were areas where the superpowers cooperated, whether that was to limit the dangers of the nuclear arms race or to deal with something kind of like a pandemic, right? And so eradicating smallpox during the 1960s and 1970s. There are areas of cooperation or at least shared interest in the US-China relationship today, but I, I think it's important to point out that there's not a tremendous amount of emphasis on positive sum outcomes 
in most Leninist worldviews. And while China is, is no longer really much of a Marxist regime, it is a Leninist regime. Uh, and so I think we have to, to bear in mind that our expectations of a positive sum relationship with China may not actually be aligned with the CCP's expectations of that relationship. A second point I would make is that um, I, I, I think it's important not to understate the ideological dimension of this competition. And this is a big point of, of argument and, and people are gonna disagree about this and, and that's fine. I, I don't think that people who argue that there is an ideological dimension of the relationship say that China is trying to overthrow capitalism or calling for, for revolution. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the argument at all. I think the argument is that China is seeking to make a world that is safe for autocracy. And that requires rolling back uh, selectively the influence of, of democracy. And so if you look at what China is doing in international organizations to try to make them friendlier to authoritarian interpretations of internet norms or human rights, if you look at the way that China and Russia cooperate to suppress the threat of so-called color revolutions in Central Asia, if you look at the way uh, that China uh, is proliferating surveillance technology that will strengthen authoritarian regimes around the globe. If you look at the way uh, that China is often involved in, in supporting and battled authoritarians in places from Latin America to Southeast Asia, it's pretty clear that the rise of Chinese power uh, is going to have the effect of tilting the balance of, a, of liberalism versus illiberalism in the international system. It's also pretty clear if you look at some of the things that Xi Jinping and other Chinese uh, commentators have said that they do view that there being an ideological dimension uh, to the competition. And so I think we need to take that seriously in terms of thinking about uh, what this competition is, even if we do recognize that it is important, it's different in important ways uh, than the Cold War. Uh, another point I, I would make is that uh, Mel is right to say that uh, there's not a parallel between the Cold War today uh, in, that, in the sense that what Kennan wrote about the Soviet Union, that it was convinced that American society must be destroyed for its own power to be secure, is probably not true of, of China. I think it is important to recognize, though, that I, the CCP wants a fundamentally different world than the one that we have become used to living to. The CCP does not want a world in which democracy is the world's dominant form of government. The CCP wants a world in which the CCP has an exclusive sphere of influence, all around its periphery. It wants a world in which it can commit genocide within its own borders. It can stifle free speech and democratic societies abroad. And no one can say boo to that. That's a very different world than the one that the United States wants. And so is, is this a confrontation that is as totalizing as, this, as the Cold War? Perhaps not. Is it a starker confrontation than we let ourselves to believe for many years? Absolutely. I have one question I'd like to raise and then, oh, do I need to stop, Bonnie? All right, give me, give me 30 seconds, right? I think my broader, my broader comment that I'll make is just that I, I'm averse to the argument uh, that because there are important differences between the Cold War and today, and indeed there are, that we can't learn anything from the Cold War. Is that really true? Is there nothing we can learn from American alliance management during the Cold War? Is there nothing we can learn from the ways that we try to tame the nuclear dangers? There's nothing we can learn from the way that we tried to develop the body of extra fees on the Soviet Union I would submit that there is. I'll stop there. Great. Clearly, we should have scheduled this for two hours. Mel, you get five minutes, and then I'll throw some questions at both of you. Okay, thanks. Once again, of course, um, when Helen and I uh, discuss these issues, um, we always realize um, there's um, a lot of common ground, even though we might st start off with star starkly different perspective perspectives. Although, in this case, I must acknowledge that Hal didn't even start off with a starkly different perspective. Um, he sort of um, granted um, right from the onset that, uh, that the position that we should call this a Cold War has, has, has problems. Um, let me just say a few things about Hal's uh, very um, salient comments. Um, you know, he said that the Cold War teaches us some valuable lessons. Uh, and I actually agree with the lessons um, that he has emphasized. So I'll repeat them. He said, the Cold War illuminates that we should be, in, that we should prepare for a sustained competition with another great power. The, the Cold War uh, 
can you have have you lost me or um, something's happened on my screen? Oh, okay. The the Cold War, Hal said, also um, suggests that um, one of the most valuable things is to have allies and friends. The Cold War, Hal said, um, should illuminate that negotiation is a good tool of competition. I, I think those are valuable points. My problem is, or why I'm skeptical about um, some of the, about applying these points to the very debate we're having, is that I do not think that you need to have a cold war or think about a cold war in order to realize the efficacy of these, what I would call truisms. Yes, great powers need to prepare for sustained competition. Yes, great powers should try to have friends and allies. Yes, great powers should realize that at particular times in their competition, negotiation and finding common ground is a good idea. Do you need to have a Cold War or think about the lessons of the Cold War to really appreciate those very good suggestions? I would suggest that using the Cold, that you can understand the value of those points without employing a Cold War analogy, which misleads us and which causes us greatly to exaggerate threats uh, and also to um, misconstrue opportunities. Let me say one last thing, Bonnie, if, I'm, if I may, about the point that um, Hal stresses with regard to ideology. Um, yes, um, the Chinese today um, obviously have a different ideological viewpoint. They obviously believe in a form of authoritarian capitalism. What I'm trying to argue, however, and what I think is extraordinarily salient is that Chinese ideological axioms do not have the resonance that Soviet Marxist Leninist axioms had in the 1940s and 1950s. We have much less to fear from the ideological conflict. Therefore, we should not use the Cold War ideology when indeed we probably did have something to fear. We have much less to fear today. And I was just reading maybe yesterday or the day before, uh, a recent poll from Pew, which um, assessed people's attitudes toward China today. And it was in different parts of the world. And it was remarkable to see the magnitude of the distrust about chi China that has spread everywhere. Not only, of course, in the United States and Britain and Germany and Sweden, but even greater distrust in places like South Korea and Japan. What's interesting is that in the early 2000s, 2002 and 2003, when Pew began polling people in different countries on what do you think of China, there was a, a very significant appreciation of China, very positive attitudes, but those attitudes have vastly changed. And therefore, I think that one needs to keep the ideological dimension in perspective. One needs to realize that one need not fear Chinese ideology as we once feared Marxism, Leninism, Soviet ideology. I have more points to make, but I think, Bonnie, you probably want me to stop, so I'll be happy to stop. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much, Mel. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, which is from my uh, colleague, uh, the Freeman Chair in China Studies at uh, CSIS, and it's on this issue of ideology. You know, many people worry that uh, the ideological challenge from China stems from Beijing's proven willingness and ability to defend authoritarianism through leveraging its market access uh, to stifle uh, criticisms. And of course, as Hao talked about, that, uh, it, it, that China is trying to make the world safe for uh, aut autocracy and authoritarianism. And there are two examples that he cites, the kerfuffle over the NBA, um, and of course now the well-known censorship in Hollywood movie uh, studios. So what he's essentially asking is, is this not a new type of ideological challenge, that it's just different than the ideological challenge that the Soviet Union posed, but is nevertheless um, uh, quite uh, uh, important and dangerous. So I'll give you just a couple of minutes to address that, and then I'll pose a, a question to Hal. Uh, oh, you're, you're addressing that question to me. Okay, yes. so, um, so you know, that's, that's um, a good question. Once again, my response is that, yes, it probably is a new form um, but the magnitude of that threat, I think, um, needs to uh, be, ke be kept, uh, needs to be measured uh, care carefully. Um, what, what I think is at the heart of this discussion about um, China's um, authoritarian threat um, in terms of, of a system gets to a very, very important point that actually does relate very much to a lesson of the Cold War that Hal actually didn't emphasize, but I know, but I know he, sh he shares this view, or if I'm wrong, Hal, please say so. <laughs> and, and that is the ideological threat from China today radiates primarily from the glaring failures of the American political and economic system at home. The attractiveness of the Chinese model is extraordinarily related to the perceived failures everywhere of American democracy right now. And those perceptions as any pollster will tell you, around the world have grown enormously during the last four years. So I would say this, that one of the most critical lessons of the Cold War, you don't need to, you didn't need, I think, to have a Cold War to know this lesson, but it was certainly a lesson of the Cold War, was that if the United States was going to compete effectively with an adversarial model of modernization and development, the United States had to make democratic capitalism work effectively at home and amongst its allies. The United States and its allies had to make democratic capitalism and social democracy, as it often was called in Europe, had to make those systems work effectively during the first half of the 20th century or during the first 40, 45 years of the 20th century, when you look at two world wars and the Great Depre Depression, those systems had failed to act in behalf of the citizenry of most countries living in democratic capitalist states. What the United States learned and what its allies learned during the early years of the Cold War was that it needed to use the state, was that it needed to use the government to help make marketplace economies work effectively, to help enhance people's perceptions that their systems were flourishing and working in their own behalf. What was monumental in the 19, late 40s and 50s and throughout most of the 60s was that everywhere in the so-called Western world, including of course, places like Japan, the system worked, the system 
worked and it garnered support. It garnered support everywhere. The reason why the competition is flowering today, this ideological competition, is because the system is not working. Okay, um, uh, Hal, let me ask you a question, which came in from Christopher Bishop, Council of Foreign Relations, University of Ottawa. Um, please be brief. How would you respond to the suggestion made by Adam Tooze and some Chinese scholars that for China and North Korea, the Cold War never really stopped? So um, I, I would be interested to hear the precise context of that, but I'll just interpret it in the way that will be most favorable to the answer that I'm, that I'm about to give. <laughs> and and I, I, I think it's entirely true that the Cold War did not stop for the Chinese Communist Party. I think there was, there was a very uh, revealing statement, which will not be news to any China watchers, but was nonetheless uh, striking, made by Fu Ying, a, a high-ranking Chinese official a number of months ago, which basically, and I'm, I'm hardly paraphrasing here, was that uh, it's the belief of the CCP that the United States has always been trying to overthrow the Chinese socialist government, uh, even during the period of the engagement policy in the 1990s and 2000s. And I think that that accurately uh, characterizes one of the key lines of, of thought in Beijing, as I understand it, which was that the United States was essentially a transactional partner with the Chinese during the Cold War and containing the Soviet Union, but that the Chinese began to perceive considerable danger from the United States even before the Cold War ended, really beginning with the Tiananmen Square massacre and its aftermath uh, in 1989. And my understanding, again, is that Chinese policymakers believe that the United States has long been pursuing the strategy of peaceful evolution uh, meant to lead eventually to the collapse of the Chinese communist regime. Now, it's not actually 100% wrong in the sense that the ultimate goal of the engagement policy of the 1990s and 2000s was to promote economic liberalization that would lead to political liberalization. But I think the comment does nonetheless provide uh, a window into the worldview that the United States uh, is grappling with in Beijing. Great. I have a question from Michael Foley, a CSIS donor, and um, he says, if it's the case that there really are no similarities with the Soviet case, then why is it that Xi Jinping spends so much time burnishing his Marxist-Leninist credentials and insist on so many uh, production of movies and study by party members? of the Soviet experience. And of course, we know for so many years, not just Xi Jinping, but uh, prior leaders uh, in China have emphasized uh, drawing lessons from uh, the Cold War and the, and the Soviet experience. So um, uh, I guess, uh, Mel, why don't we turn to you uh, to comment on that? Sure. Um, I've, I've read quite a few of Xi Jinping's speeches and, and his major reports to party conferences. And I think the theme that emerges most starkly is the theme of building socialism with Chinese characteristics. Building socialism with Chinese characteristics. And what's interesting in his major speeches actually, when you read them, is that the focus on foreign policy um, is pretty minimal compared to the focus on producing vast change inside China, to make China a moderately wealthy country um, and to enhance the stature of the party inside China and to make China respected. Um, the theme of respect, of course, is a long-term Chinese theme that, that transcends communists and nationalists and brings all Chinese together. So um, I, th I think it's easy um, for us to select specific elements of, of uh, Chinese leaders' speeches uh, and to dwell on them. But I also think if you place um, these issues in context, you see that the Chinese 
generally, and Xi Jinping, when he talks about socialism with Chinese characteristics and make it in, into a great technological and economic power, he's talking about building Chinese greatness. He does want to make China a strong presence in East Asia and really in the, in the global economy. That's natural for a great power. I, I don't see why we need to invoke the Cold War in order to understand the way Chinese leaders want to operate as their country gets bigger and stronger. Hal, I have a question for you about um, whether you see security dilemma dynamics in the US-China relationship and whether you can compare these to the uh, US-Soviet. Uh, uh, dynamics during the during the Cold War. So, you know, essentially uh, the security dilemma being where one state um, intends to enhance its security uh, leads the other to respond, producing tensions that can create conflict, even though neither side really seeks conflict. So is the security dilemma at work during the Cold War and is it relevant today or is it, is it different? So I, I think there are ways in which the security dilemma may well have been at, at work during the Cold War. And so you, you can certainly see instances in which um, the, the gaining of one military capability by one side, whether that is viewed in a defensive context or not, leads the other side to feel that it, that it wants or must have a similar equivalent capability, if only to ensure its own security, which, which is kind of like the classic arms race security dilemma that we talk about. And, and I think that, you know, we can certainly identify uh, areas in, in any rivalry where uh, steps that one side takes to defend its interest are perceived as threatening by the other side. That, that strikes me as, as uncontroversial and true. I think the problem with viewing uh, the Cold War through the security dilemma lens writ large uh, is the same as the problem of, of viewing the US-China relationship through the security dilemma lens writ large, which is that it, it, it tends to take intent out of the picture. And, and so it, the fact of the matter is that, that China has re, what we would call revisionist ambitions in East Asia and more broadly, they don't, they don't make a secret of these things, right? It's, it's quite clear that China would like to bring Taiwan back under its control uh, at some point in some way using military force if necessary, just to give one uh, example of that. And so if, if what is essentially destabilizing the situation is the revisionist aims of one power, then I, I think it can be a little bit tricky to say if the United States takes steps, for instance, or the Taiwanese take steps to make a Chinese conquest of Taiwan more difficult, that what you have is a security dilemma. What, what you may actually have is a revisionist power that is attempting to change the status quo, facing you with the choice of either responding by strengthening your own capabilities or inviting the instability uh, that, that comes from, from uh, failing to maintain the balance. Anything you want to add to that, Mel? Yes, um, I, I think the security dilemma was very much at work uh, in, in the early Cold War. And um, what worries me is that we might um, uh, fail to extrapolate the appropriate lessons. So what's interesting is that when um, George Marshall and George Kennan and their colleagues uh, discussed the initiation of the Truman Doctrine and most significantly uh, the Marshall Plan and the steps that they were going to take to bring about the uh, unification and revival of the Western economic revival of the Western zones of Germany. When they planned to take these steps, Kennan actually said to Marshall explicitly, when we take these steps, uh, we are in effect going to be pr provoking a Soviet counteraction. We will be challenging what the Soviets regard as their vital interests. But we can probably do this. It will probably not spiral out of control, Kennan said, and this was the core of containment because they will ultimately, as it spirals upward, as it did, for example, during the Berlin crisis of 1948, as it spirals upward, the Soviets will step back because they know we have greater strength. And actually that is what happened. Um, and it really gave great encouragement to American policymakers during the early Cold War. 
So I'm worried. Um, I don't have an answer as to how it's going to play out with China today, Bonnie, but I think your question is extraordinarily salient um, because um, the each side has to really understood, understand what its vital interests are and whether the other side may or may not step back if those interests are challenged. So um, I think it's extraordinarily um, uh, important to think about the security dilemma and a spiraling conflict when you don't have such clear strategic superiority and economic domination. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'll give you each two minutes and then we'll go to our voting. So the last question is from uh, Steve Ackerman, uh, who works in Congressman Russ Fulcher's office. And he asked, does the panel believe that China is willing to take on the costs of regional hegemonism in Asia or dominant or be dominant in other regions around the world? He adds, I don't see extensive overseas military deployments to back its economic interests. They simply appear aggrieved um, to being challenged but that in itself is not a grand strategy. So does China have a grand strategy? Is this necessary? Um, is it necessary for both sides to have a grand strategy in order to call this uh, a cold war? And anything you'd like to uh, comment on, on, uh, on that question. So Mel, why don't you go first and then we'll let Hal uh, add his two minutes. Well, I, I'm not sure that China has um, a grand strategy, but I certainly, um, I think that it probably has a clearer sense of its of its goals and the appropriate tactics to pursue those goals uh, than than does the United States. And I think, um, um, this, this, despite the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, I, that that is a global initiative. Um, China's focus clearly is, um, you know, on East Asia and South Asia, and China has significantly increased its military capabilities. But the, but the underlying suggestion of, the, of this questioner is absolutely right. What's pretty noteworthy is that even though China increases significantly its military expenditures, Chinese military expenditures to this day are only about a third of what the United States expenditures are. And Chinese spending on the military as a percentage of GDP is actually much less than America's percentage of military spending on its GDP. So um, I, I think uh, uh, Chinese do want as any great power to expand their influence, particularly in their region. What's important, I'll conclude, is for the United States, and I think Hal implied this at, at the beginning, and I totally agree with him, the problem with American policy today, in contrast to what I would say was American policy in the early Cold War, is that we don't have a good definition of our vital interests. What, you know, we know that the people who are afraid of China's Cold War, so-called Cold War policies, we know that they want to somewhat to contain them in some vague sense. But that notion of containment is not coupled with a very precise notion of what our vital interests are. Um, are there places where we can reconcile interests um, with, the, with the Chinese? Um, and that's what we need to focus on. I would just say that during the early Cold War, what was so influential about George Kennan in particular and why he had such a profound impact for a while on some of his colleagues was that he had a very clear definition that the, of, of what American ambitions were. You must not let Soviet Union gain control over the industrial resources and skilled human power of, North, of, of Northeast Asia, meaning Japan, and you must not let them co-opt Germany and Western Europe into their orbit. That was a very defined conception of America's vital interests. And I'm not sure we have such a systematic, clear definition today. Okay, Hal, you get the last word. 
if, if China doesn't seek hegemony in, in East Asia and global influence beyond, they're doing a pretty good imitation of it from, from the, the massive military buildup that, that really is only useful in a context of, of trying to keep American forces out of the region and thus establish a degree of geopolitical dominance there, but also in the things we're seeing where China is, is con consistently projecting its influence military and otherwise farther and farther abroad into the Indian Ocean, into the Horn of Africa, into the Arctic, and so on and so forth. It's going to take China a long time before they have anything close to the sort of global project power projecting capabilities that the United States has. But I think we're, we're seeing some signs that the intent may ultimately be there. Before showing you the results of our final poll, I want to remind everybody about the results of our pre-debate poll. And we had uh, previously shown the number of votes. So and in order to make this comparable, we've changed this, this to show the percentage of votes. So we had 42% of the respondents agree with the proposition and 58% disagreed. And that was 53 votes total for the pre-debate poll. So now I'm going to show you the results of our post-debate poll. We had 35% of respondents agree with the proposition and 65% disagree, a total of 66 votes. So a few more voted uh, after the debate than before. The post-debate poll shows a 7% point decrease from the pre-debate poll for respondents agreeing with the proposition and, of course, a 7 percentage point increase for respondents disagreeing with the proposition. So thank you all for voting. I really enjoyed the debate, and I want to thank uh, both of you for, for joining us today. Well, I just want to thank Hal and you for um, presenting this opportunity. I love debating these issues with Hal. Thanks, Hal. I, I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you both.